for another edition of the Blue White Breakdown by Penn Lives football crack team of Greg Pickle, who, who that's not me, I'm Bob Flounders. Greg Pickle is joining me remotely as always, creeping into the later stages of January, which is good. I'm not a big cold weather guy. Uh, maybe some of you guys are, but I am not. So the sooner we get into February and March, I think the better I know I'll be, but let's uh Let's kick this off. couple things to get to, but the main thing we're going to talk about is we heard from James Franklin, Penn State's now eighth-year coach. I can't believe I'm saying that. Eighth-year coach, entering his eighth year, hired in the winter of 2014. Eighth-year coach finally met with the press as it was, it was billed, Greg, as a season-ending wrap-up, but I think everyone really wanted to talk to him about his decision to move on from Kirk Shiraka and to hire Mike Yersich, the former Texas OC. And he was more than happy to talk about that. Uh, I thought he had some interesting comments. It kind of really solidifies some things in my mind about uh, the decision-making process, Greg. But well, I'll start with you. Uh, what stood out to you about James' uh, responses when asked about uh, moving on from Kirk after one year and going uh, with Mike Yersich? Yeah, I don't think you mentioned it was the 2020 uh, season wrap up. I don't think the 2020 season came up at all. It was all 2021 and beyond. But yeah, I mean, you and I had both speculated back after uh, the first podcast after the move was made that James clearly felt like Yersich was a guy who he wanted to work with. He wanted to bring in for some time now. Maybe he had uh, dreamed of bringing him in uh, when Ricky Ronnie left before they hired Kirk Sharaka. And obviously, you know, that didn't work out as he went to Texas. But with Tom Herman's staff being let go, he, you know, James Franklin said that Mike Yersich was a guy he's been talking to for a long time. And it worked out as I, I think a marriage of both of them won it. It's obviously very tough for Kirk Sharaka, as we've mentioned, because I don't really think it's a reflection of him as much as it is the fact that. James wants to have Mike Yersich run his offense, and it's never worked out before, but this time it did. You know, some of the way James did describe, uh, the, you know, the the change, though, was interesting to me. He talked about it'll get us closer to the kind of – it's a philosophical difference and closer to how we want to play. It was almost like he was implying that, you know, Kirk Soraka was forced on him or something. I didn't really understand any of that, but – you know, obviously they've run a uh, style of offense dating back to Joe Moorhead that was exciting and that put points up and moved the ball and, they, you know, on and on and on. So uh, I don't know if Kirk's offense was going to be able to do that. Of course, we'll never know now, but we know Mike Yersich is Ken, but he has obviously come in and get the quarterback situation sorted out and then go from there. Yeah, Greg, I, the more that James talked and James is always uh... – like most coaches, James is always very careful when he chooses his words. Um, he he did not come out and say anything, I think, negative towards Kirk Shiraka. And Kirk, you know, um, that 2019 season he had at Minnesota, I think, got him noticed. Uh, they beat Penn State. I'm sure that got him noticed by James at Penn State. But, you know, it just seemed like <clears throat> the way that James talked about it um, – I think James was hopeful that he could get Kirk to see what his vision for the Penn State offense was and how it looked in the past and how he wanted it to be. And it didn't really, I don't, maybe, maybe the pandemic had something to do with it. Maybe the fact they didn't have a lot of on field coaching leading up to the first game against Indiana. But it, listening to James talk, like it didn't, it didn't feel to be like <clears throat> he felt Kirk ever got what he was trying to tell him he wanted to see from his offense it was too much of maybe uh the way Kirk called games as to whether uh, uh, regarded it was too much of how Kirk called his games maybe and not enough of what James wanted to see whether it was uh you know whether it was tempo whether it was spreading the ball around whether it was playing fast you know scoring points in bunches sense of urgency all that stuff it just seems like James wanted that and was trying to get Kirk maybe headed in that direction but it re it, it really never happened Greg and I I my personal opinion is I think James knew very early 
in the 2020 season that he was going to be in the market for a new offensive coordinator, um, if possible. I guess my question, though, is do you think that Kirk would have stuck around for another year if Mike Yersich wasn't available? Yes, I do. I, I just – Maybe that's I just I didn't we none of us saw this coming and I don't think it it happens if you know Mike Yersich isn't available to run this offense so I mean unless James Franklin had some other name in mind that we wouldn't have thought of or couldn't have got to in terms of guesses right. how he would replace Kirk Sharaka I mean I just I don't think there's any doubt like you know if there was this great philosophical difference they would have moved on from him pretty much as soon as the season ended they didn't do that and. You you know, the way the way it was, you know, James kind of said it happened quick. This change happened quick. And I think that tells you all you need to know that there wasn't a search for candidates necessarily as much as there was a yeah. search to find a way to get Mike Yersich in here once he became available when Tom Herman's staff got fired. So, no, I have a hard time thinking that they would have moved on from Kirk or vice versa after just one season had Yersich not become available. But, you know, again, for Penn State, I think James knows that, they have to put points on the board and they have to, uh, you know, do some things differently and more consistently on offense. What were the three things he pointed out, Bob? Less turnovers, more points and and tempo. And so uh, this was not an offense, though, that, you know, at least in the points department, I think they were among the best in the Big Ten when it comes to uh, point score. I know they padded that total against some bad teams, but, um, you know, all, and I don't think Kirk Sherrock is necessarily to blame for Sean Clifford's turnover problems. But, yeah. yeah, all told, I just think it was a move that happened by the chance of Tom Herman being let go and not necessarily, uh, Tom, yeah, you know, not necessarily James looking for a replacement for Sherrock. Yeah, Um I, I think you're right. I do think, though, that James was pretty unhappy with the way the offense looked early. And um, I think Yersich was probably always his guy, but I, I, I don't know. I, there was some discontent, I thought, in some of, the, some of James's reasoning. He mentioned that the number 40 points, you know, being able to score 40 points to win games. To me, that means high 30s. And you look at how they started the season – you know, they lose 36-35 to Indiana. You know, uh, I think it was it 38-25 to Ohio State. Uh, Maryland scored 35 on them. Uh, Nebraska scored 30 on them. I think James felt like some of those games should have been winnable. Not Maybe not the Maryland game, maybe not the Ohio State game. Clearly the Indiana game was winnable. Um, and so was the Nebraska game. Not so much the, not so much the Iowa game, but um, – and also, uh, part of me wonders, Greg, you know, so James is selling his vision of Penn State football and what he wants it to look like, entertaining, fast-paced, um, getting back to maybe how they played in 2017, which was, you know, I think of all the years that uh, James has been at Penn State, that offense was probably the most fun to watch. That and the second half of the 2016 season, that was fun. But he's, you know, he's selling Penn State football, Greg. Not only, you know, he's got to put fans in the seats, but he's also got to get recruits to want to play in his offense. And I, you know, the more we watch that Penn State offense in 2020, Greg, you know, you know, even even when they won games, the Rutgers game, the Michigan game, the Michigan State game, that was not a fun offense to watch. It was they were grinding it away. And I think another thing that bothered him, uh, Greg, was they were very predictable, especially, you know, anytime it was third and one or third and two, he knew what they were going to do. When they got into the red zone, I think defenses had a real good read. There was only three or four or five plays they had to defend. Um, and I think that predictability really bothered James. And I, I know that they might have been limited in some of their options in the running game and they didn't have Pat Fryermuth, but – I think James is trying to send a message not only to the fan base, but to recruits that we need to play differently. We need to look differently and he needs to get the top athletes to Penn state. And he's not going to get them uh, to Penn state. If they're going to win games, 23, 20, or they're going to lose games, you know, uh, you know they're going to lose games, you know, 30 to 23. I just think it was a bad sell and he's trying to score as many points as possible because he needs to upgrade, up, upgrade his recruiting. Uh, and, and he knows it. 
Yeah, I mean, you look at that 2022 group, Bob. We've talked about it a lot. Three four-star receivers committed, two four-star tight ends committed. Bo Prabola, the quarterback from Central York, who had just an incredible year uh, in 2020, a part of that group yeah. as well. You know, Mike Yurcich is obviously going to come in and put some touch on what he's looking for, both in the quarterback room and and the offense overall. So, yeah, I think it's a fair point. I mean this move wasn't just about the class of 2022, but, you know, again, we've talked about this before guys are going to be able to take visits again. And I'm not saying any of Penn state's, what is it? Eight 2022 commits will decide to start taking visits and will look elsewhere and will try and, uh, you know, look at some other suitors, but it's going to be tempting to, I mean, and not just because of, you know, what Penn state did offensively last year. It seems like a lot of the kids can kind of understand that, you know what, that didn't work. So we're going to, they're going to bring in this new guy and, I really like what he's about and he's what I want to play for. And they're fine with that. And I think they like Franklin and their position coaches and all of that, but these guys have not been out the campuses since last March. And some of them may not have been anywhere prior to that. So whenever, whether it's April, whether it's later in the year, you know, these guys are going to be tempted, I think, and, and with good reason to take visits and go see other schools and you better have all your ducks in a row in terms of what you were selling them versus what you're showing them on the field. So that'll play a role in, in how things shake out as well. Of course, you know, we expect Mike Yurcich to come in and power this offense up. We thought the same for Kirk Shiraka. To your point, it was very predictable at times and very just not imaginative. So, yeah, you know, it was interesting to hear uh, that whole thing explained. And you're right. They've mapped out now what they want this program and offense to look like. And it's not a surprising uh, direction, but it's one they're going to have to hit on, no doubt. Yeah. Okay. We're already halfway through the blue. My voice cracked there. We're already halfway through uh, the blue white breakdown. I'm Bob Flounders, joined by Greg Pickle. Uh, Thanks to all you guys who listen and watch. Uh, we're, we are still in the plans of kind of, we're still in the stages, excuse me, of trying to map out some plans, <laughs> plans for the future of the podcast. Uh, we need to get Dave Jones a little bit more involved. I know he's chomping at the bit, Greg, to do more blue white breakdown podcasts, but, uh, just tell the audience where they can listen to us, where they can find us, uh, how they can find us and, you know, how they can maybe let us know. Uh, evaluate us, subscribe to us. Uh, What can we do to get better? What do they want to talk about? We aim to please, Greg, so how can the audience kind of get better in tune with the Blue White Breakdown? That's right, Bob. The Blue White Breakdown, weekly, daily, depending on what you're looking for, you and I. And uh, obviously, like you said, we'll get Dave more involved. Dustin Hawkinsmith still pumping out the daily podcast. And you can find all that wherever you get your audio, Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, any place that has podcasts where you can find us and the Blue White Breakdown. And then the video version of this, youtube.com slash all Penn State. Yeah. You can find those there. And uh, you're right. We've been promising a more solidified plan for this podcast the last couple of weeks now. I Maybe next week, the week we finally lock that in. Um, all right, let's move this along. Uh, let's move a little bit away from James' thoughts on Kirk Shiraka and Mike Yurcich. He still had uh, a lot to talk about on Monday. I got a question for you. Should, should we start to be concerned a little bit, Greg, about the future uh, of the Penn State quarterback position? Now, uh, as we talk about this, uh, Sean Clifford and Will Levis are back. Uh, you know, uh, Taekwon is back. Uh, but they've had a lot of turnover um, with younger quarterbacks in the co- last couple of years. Um, Michael, uh, Michael, jo- uh, Michael Johnson transferred out. Uh, now Michael, uh, Michael Bowens is out after one year. He, I, I just saw where I think he's headed to Oklahoma, which is a, a smart move for him if he can play there because that is an exciting offense. But it just seems like they can't really settle or get, get a, a young quarterback to stay at Penn State. Um, you know, Christian Bayou. I hope it's such a, such a hockey name. I think uh, I believe is is the next choice as maybe the future of the quarterback position. You mentioned you mentioned Bo Prabula, but you know the, Clifford and Levis aren't getting any younger. I think Sean's going to have I don't know judging by last year if he's got two years left or he's got one year left. But these guys are now upperclassmen, and we talked about James being able to sell 
uh, the future of Penn State offensive football to recruits. He needs he needs a quarterback though for the future that they can build around and they, that they can mold. And Greg, do you feel strongly that that guy is either on the roster? So that would that would that would that would probably be Christian, or he's a you know he's a part of the 2022 class, and that would be Pravula, But do you still think that James and maybe Mike are tinkering and looking for, you know, maybe the future of the quarterback position at Penn State, whether it's in 2022 or 2023? Yeah, I mean, I think the thing with Bowens and our friend Audrey Snyder at The Athletic had talked to him yesterday or the day before, or the day today, I can't remember, sometime in the last couple of days. And yeah. I mean, his basic uh, sort of thoughts were that, you know, Oklahoma only has uh, their two extremely talented scholarship quarterbacks and Spencer Rattler, who's going to be a part of the Heisman talk, and Caleb yep. Williams, the number one quarterback in the class of 2021. But that's it. They only have those two guys on scholarship in the quarterback room. Penn State, of course, that brings in Bayou. Uh, Prabul is on deck. Uh, you know, there's not a guarantee. I would say it's 50-50 that, you know, they find a quarterback in the transfer portal. So, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is, is that I feel like Oklahoma's quarterback room is more closely aligned with what the future of college football quarterbacks are going to look like than Penn State. You know, James said at one point in the past that he wants to have five scholarship quarterbacks on campus. I I just don't see how that's possible in the age of the transfer portal, in the age of, you know, guys moving around, uh, you know, at least once, maybe more. It just, I think it's going to be hard for, um, it's going to be hard for, you know, these schools to keep more than three or four guys on scholarship at quarterback at a time, just simply because of the fact that these guys want to go play somewhere. And once you get a young guy established, and obviously Penn State hasn't necessarily done that, but, you know, once you get a young guy established, the path to getting on the field is extremely difficult. So I I don't blame Bowens for what he did. And I I do think that the situation that he's walking into at Oklahoma, look, Penn Oklahoma has two studs. uh, That's all you need. I mean, I know, obviously, if they both got hurt, you'd be done. But that's going to be the case, whether you have three, you know, whenever you get your third string guy, you're probably going to be done anyway. So, yeah, I know what you're saying. They do need to find a guy they can develop. I don't know if Christian Bay used that guy. It's hard to say. And it's not a slight against him, but he didn't have a senior season. So we haven't seen him on the field in over a year. And there were some nice things shown on his junior tape, but I think if you read some of the evaluations from 247 Sports and Rivals, those guys were also expecting and hoping to see some senior year improvement, which because of the pandemic never happened. So then you have the other one, Taquan Roberson. What has he done during <laughs> not just last year, but also the offseason? A lot of people, Bob, wanted him to get a chance to play last year when Penn State's quarterbacks were struggling. That never was the case until I think extremely late in the Illinois game. So, you know, time will tell. I think that guy is on the roster. I think I would say this, Mike Yurcich has worked with a lot of really good quarterbacks and he's developed guys into being really good quarterbacks. So I think you have the right guy to try and develop somebody on the roster, but I don't know if any of them jump off the page at you at this point. Yeah. Um, And it would be helpful uh, to kind of, to kind of follow up on that. It would be helpful for Penn state and their coaching staff to maybe have a spring practice uh, to kind of look at some of these guys and get some development going because the last time Penn State was on the practice field in spring was 2019. So that's we're, – we're two years away from that now. And J- it was funny, James, James said spring practice is on their nine-month calendar looking out. Um, they have a nine-month calendar that I like to put together uh, for the coaches and the players and the players' parents so they could kind of anticipate – what might be going on and you could kind of make some plans, but boy, if that thing is on the calendar, Greg, it's got to be written in pencil because typically, you know, in a typical year, uh, I think we're getting ready. If not, and it it hasn't already started. We're just getting Penn state's just getting into winter conditioning. Um, And then, you know, I think usually I believe it's around mid March, they're winding that down and they're getting ready for the start of spring practice. Now we're about two months away from mid March, Greg, and James has pretty much said they haven't really heard anything from the big 10 or the NCAA about spring practice. And I could be getting ahead of our, uh, we could be getting ahead of ourselves, but 
your feelings on a when the Big Ten, who's notoriously slow, or the NCAA might come out with some kind of announcement uh, regarding spring, what do you? What can that possibly look like? I mean, you know, there's just so much uh, stuff to kind of worry about with regard to that. Um, do you think they would? Do you think they would delay it? Number one, and if they don't delay it, Greg, what do you think spring practice could possibly look like? for Penn State? Is it going to be back to um, more online instruction and Zooms? Or, you know, I believe during the football season, you know, they were allowed out on the practice field, but they had to follow some very, very, uh, very, very strict protocols, which Penn State was able to do. But, you know, usually, usually spring practice is a little bit more physical and, you know, a little bit more. uh, I just don't know if they can do that. Yeah, you're right, Bob. I mean, I think one thing that's pretty clear is that James Franklin mentioned a couple of times during the last season that he wanted – remember how long it took him to have in-person meetings? They were doing all their stuff over Zoom, and they were in three different locker rooms and all this. And I can almost guarantee you that however they approach spring practice, it's not going to be like that. They're going to do as much in-person as possible because it's clear that it didn't work out the other way, even though that's just how they had to do it. But yeah, to your point, you know, the, when you look at kind of the lay of the land of things, and I, this is not necessarily trying to equate the two, but the NFL Combine's already been canceled. It's going to be virtual. You know, no conference, to the best of my knowledge, has come out with a plan for spring practice yet. Now, you're right. The Big Ten will almost certainly be last, or they'll be the first to push it back one way or the other. But, you know, I, I don't – you know, we're talking, what, about two months' time from now that they typically make it started right around the middle of March? and Yeah. I just don't know if that's feasible to think that they'll that things will be at a place where they can get back to it the way they normally do. So, I mean, what does that mean? Do they push it back to April and see where things are then? You know, do they add more time prior to the start of the season? That that's all the stuff that has to be figured out. And you know, I I, I think you're right that they are planning for a normal spring practice, but it's written in pencil. It's not written in pen or even stone, obviously. And We'll just have to wait and see, much like the 2020 season. I think it's going to be a waiting game, and we'll find out shortly before, you know, practice is supposed to start in the spring whether or not they're going to have it. I have a hard time thinking that we're going to hear a decision in February or, you know, even late February. I could see it being early March until we actually get word one way or the other. Yeah, and remember, the season started in late late uh, October, so really, um, you know, you know, Ohio State's only about 10 days removed from playing in that championship game. Uh, I think if they wanted to, uh, they could push back spring at least six weeks. Um, And I think that, you know, I thought the season came off. I shouldn't say that. The Penn State season came off. uh, You know, they were able to play consecutively for nine weeks in a row, but very few other teams in the Big Ten, maybe one other team in the Big Ten, was able to do that. But I think the idea, what I think we were looking at uh, Penn state's opener at Wisconsin. I was it the, is it September 4th or something like that? I mean, that it it seems like a long time away, Greg, but it really, it's really not that long uh, away. And I guess Greg, to to expect maybe them to play on er, in early September, it, it could definitely happen, but you would just like to see the, it just, it just doesn't feel nearly as normal. Uh, yet for uh, for the world to kind of function. So I don't know. I, I would imagine that you're going to see some spring practice for sure, but it, it's definitely not going to look like it looked uh, in 2019, which is the last year of really an actual spring practice. But the, Penn State, I think, I think Penn State and some other teams could really use it. So we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Greg, was there anything else uh, that James Franklin t- uh, touched on during his, he's talked for about half, uh, half an hour on Monday. Anything else jump out to you, whether it was, he talked a little bit about recruiting. He talked a little bit about defensive football. Um, he, he touched on some topics. He mentioned some players specifically. Anything jump out to you as far as um, maybe interesting uh, from the coach's perspective? 
Yeah, I'll make it quick as we wrap up here. But, you know, a couple of things, you know, he mentioned defensive end and defensive back is the two positions that either through the transfer portal or through the class of 2021 high school wise that they're still looking to add some guys. And I think they will. I don't think there's any doubt about that. He brought it up too many times that they had wiggle room for that not to be the case. So keep an eye out for that. You know, going back to the 2020 season, one thing he did mention was I got the impression that going to a bowl game was never really a serious consideration. I mean, I know they kind of played it along and stringed it along at the time, and I have no doubt that they did give it some serious thought, but sounded to me like there was not really a whole lot of interest from anyone uh, to go to a bowl game, which makes that decision that was ultimately made less, even less of a surprise in hindsight. And, you know, when he talks about the defense, Bob, I just think that, you know, we all, all I think all, a lot of people around and that followed the Penn State program thought there'd be some changes there. That's not going to be the case, but they have a lot of work to fit, to, to do there. They get Jaquan Brisker and three Castro fields back and that'll help. But, you know, he had mentioned the pass rush could be better and more productive and they're going to have to find, you know, it's going to be great if you score 35, 40 points a game. But if you give up that many to the higher power offense on the schedule, it's not going to make much of a difference. So they have to finally this year shore up the tackling and fix that last line. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm with you. I'm with you. Brent Pry, his defensive coordinator has been there as long as he has. Um, and he's going to stick with Brent, obviously. And he's going to stick with all of his defensive coaches. Um, <laughs> I shouldn't say that it appears he's going to stick with all of his defensive coaches because we've been burned too many times, but it sure seems like uh, there's only going to be one change. It was a big one, but we'll see. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I, I just think the defense, um, you look at the end of the year numbers, Greg, and they look pretty good. But it was really two seasons. They didn't play well the first five games, and they played awfully. I thought they played much better the last month of the season, but they didn't really play teams that were, I would call, uh, I think they all had losing records. They were, they were the bottom of the barrel in the Big Ten, so they were able to get better. Uh, in those instances, they still won the games, but um, I, 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 I think the fan base is a little bit more focused on the zero and five than than the four consecutive wins, and I think James knows that. So we'll see. The defense has to get better. Hopefully, we'll have some news for you guys on spring practice, um, or at least maybe a plan for the off season for Penn State and the rest of the Big Ten. But we will be back next week. Uh, thanks for tu- thanks for tuning into the Blue White Breakdown. Continue to subscribe, continue to rate us. Thanks for all the interaction uh, with the comments and the questions in our uh, tech subscriber mailbag. We, we certainly appreciate that. And before you know it, Dave Jones is going to be on one of those suckers, on one of these suckers, and I'm sure he's going to have some strong thoughts on where Penn State's headed. Mm-hmm.